And as you're turning there, we want to welcome James Kuhn, Jr. with us. He is here from Derry, Pennsylvania. Good to have you. Thank you for being here. Amen. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. We're going to be reading verses 6 through 9. You could follow with me in your Bibles if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Did I tell you 2 Corinthians? <clears throat> I meant 1 Corinthians. You should have known that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we've had a good time already worshiping you in spirit and in truth, in song, in worship of giving, in prayer. And now, Lord, we come to the preaching time where the Word of God is opened and we allow you by your Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and to move it from the pages of the Scripture into our hearts through our hearts and minds that, Father, we might be receptive vessels uh, of your Word today. I pray, my Father, but by your Holy Spirit, you'd open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person to receive your Word, accomplish your will. Father, may you do that which is pleasing to thee today. May it challenge us, may it change us, and may we give you the glory for it. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he mentions a wisdom that is not of this world. A wisdom unknown by natural means. A wisdom that cannot be learned from earthly books nor passed down by worldly minds. He writes of a wisdom that is of God. James refers to this wisdom when he writes of earthly wisdom, which he describes as sensual and devilish. And then he writes about the wisdom that is from above, and he describes it as peaceable and gentle. There is the wisdom of men upon which they pride themselves, and there is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of men is written in their books. And the wisdom of God is written in his book. The wisdom of men is of the earth. And the wisdom of God is from heaven. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 21 that the world by its own wisdom knew not God. Indeed, the Apostle Paul recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. So how did this sad situation come about? That man would be blocked off to the wisdom of God, that he would be at the mercy of his own foolish wisdom. Well, Romans chapter 1 tells us, about mankind and says when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. That's how we got here. Mankind long ago decided that it didn't need God nor His Word and set about to establish their own wisdom based upon their own limited and paltry knowledge and experience. And so 1 Corinthians 3.19 records, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And so we have two stark contrasts, do we not? The wisdom of the world, which is sensual and devilish and of man, and the wisdom of God, which is peaceable and gentle and of God. When it comes to things beyond the senses, 
and beyond the physical, mankind has no clue. Mankind gropes about and stumbles in the darkness of his own making, refusing to see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. But praise the Lord that he still shines the light of his word into the darkness of this world as a beacon of hope and salvation to all that they might believe. And when they believe, they experience the reality of God. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. We sit here this morning as believers as born-again ones, and I think we fail to grasp and appreciate the reality and truth of the light of God that has been shined in our hearts by the gospel through the Word. Amen. We think that everybody else has it. They don't. And you didn't have it before you trusted Christ as your Savior. Read what Paul writes about the wisdom of God right here in our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 10. It said, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Folks, we talk about things the world can't talk about. We compare things that the world can't compare. We see things the world can't see. We understand things the world can't understand. We know things that the world can't know. Why? Because they are revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Several things about the wisdom of God are mentioned here. In verse 10, it can only be revealed by God's Spirit. In verses 11 and 12, as the Spirit of man knows the wisdom of man, so the Spirit of God knows the wisdom of God. And thus, the necessity of being born again of God's Spirit and becoming children of light, in whom dwells the very Spirit of the living God. But if you've never been, then you can't truly know. If you've never been born again, you don't understand what I'm talking about. You can't know it. If you've never been born again, it's impossible for you to know what it's like to be born again and to have the light of God shine in your heart. You know, it's kind of like scuba diving. <clears throat> now, you can hear all the words about scuba diving. And you can see all the pictures about scuba diving, but you cannot know the truth of what it's like unless you've been there and done that. The world cannot understand the wisdom of God. And then he says that man's wisdom in verse 13 cannot teach spiritual things. <laughs> Listen to that. Man's wisdom cannot teach spiritual things. It can teach religious things but it cannot teach spiritual things. Isn't that exciting? Yes. Now this morning I'd like to see several things that are true and that await the child of God beyond the bounds of this earthly realm. I want to share with you this morning things that are beyond our imagination. Number one, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the point number one is this, the things, the things. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. This is a free quotation of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64, 4 and 65, 17. <clears throat> there are things of which the human eye has never seen. There are sounds which the human ear has never heard. 
And there are things of which the human mind has not and indeed cannot even imagine. Our imaginations are limited to that which we have experienced with our senses. We can dream and imagine of things that do not exist, but even our dreams and imaginations can only extrapolate, theorize, or hypothesize based upon things previously seen, heard, or experienced. All of your dreams and all of your imaginations are limited by that which you have experienced through your senses. You understand? But God is telling us twice in the scripture, in Isaiah and here, that there are things that exist in a dimension which we are quite incapable of experiencing. And things that our minds cannot imagine because we have no physical basis to support such imagination. Are you following me here? God's saying, there's things that are beyond your imagination. You have no clue. And it's impossible for you to actually get a hold of them because you have nothing upon which to base your imagination except that which is of this earth. There are spiritual realities that physical beings cannot know or even imagine that exist. I know what verse 10 says. It says, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. And He has. God has revealed to us those things in His Word. In His Word, we read about seraphim and teraphim. Now, you don't know what a seraphim looks like. And you don't know what a teraphim looks like. We... They're angelic beings. We read in the Word of God of mansions that Jesus had prepared for us. We read in the Bible of streets of gold and gates of pearl. We read about the brightness of the glory of the Lord Jesus, which precludes any need of sun or moon or stars or any artificial light of any kind. However, did you notice that all of these descriptions are in language that is limited by our human understanding and couched in terms that we are physically familiar with? Did you notice that? Now, here's one friend. Jesus said he goes to prepare a mansion. <clears throat> well, most of us don't even know what a mansion looks like, first of all. <laughs> and if we're going to think of a mansion, you can think of the biggest most expensive mansion you can think of. But it falls short of the mansion that Jesus is making because he just used the word mansion so we could get some concept of what he's preparing for us. But the Bible says our eye hath not seen any mansion like that mansion. I don't even think it's going to be called a mansion in heaven. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be incredible. We know in our spirit that these things are real, but we perceive with human mind what they will look like and sound like. Let me suggest to you that when we are there, it will not be like anything we've ever seen or heard or experienced here. When we get to heaven, it's not going to be some super duper here. It's not going to be some glorious here. It's going to be an absolutely unthought of, unheard of, unimagined there. I mean, you talk about blowing your mind. The things which God hath prepared for us will be of such a nature, a spiritual nature, that it is impossible for any human being to presently perceive it. Paul said that such things have not even entered into the heart. Of man. Mankind as a whole is incapable of any imagination of them. You know, the Bible says about God that his ways are past finding out. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we get the most intelligent geniuses of the ages and get them in a great committee and they couldn't figure out God. They couldn't figure out God's ways. His ways are past finding out. And the Bible says, who hath been his counselor? 
There's nothing mankind has ever known or experienced that God would ask man, hey, what's that like? God doesn't say to man, what do you think? What do you think I should do here? Hey, you got any, you got any advice? No, God doesn't have a counselor. Why? Because he's, in a, he's, in a, he's on a shelf all by himself. There's no one like him. He's all alone in his realm of Godhood. And so those of us who are saved, and if you are not saved and you'll get saved, can look forward with wonder and excitement to seeing and hearing things for the very first time. Things that we have never seen, things we never have, and things which have no tie nor resemblance nor precursor here on earth. Here's what Isaiah said. Listen to this. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, here it is, and the former, former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Wow. Now, here's how different it's going to be. When we're there, we, we will, nothing of this world will even come into our... Right now, we're on this world, right? And it hasn't entered into our heart what God has up there. But when we get up there, it won't even enter into our mind what was down here. We won't remember this at all. Hey, your happiest day will be a day of grief and mourning compared to what heaven's going to be like. And so if God says these things will not be remembered and they will not enter into our mind, then what's up there must be so different that it can't even remember, remind us of anything here. I don't know about you, that's pretty exciting to me. Those are the things. But I want you to look at point number two, the, ple the pleasures. Go with me in Psalm chapter 16. Psalm number 16. And look in verse 11. And so God says, I've got things. Sounds you've never heard. Things you've never seen. Stuff you can't even imagine. You don't have any clue. It's just so awesome. I got that waiting for you. Now you see why Paul said to depart is far better and all right, now we're going to Psalm 16, verse 11. Point number two, the pleasures. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There are not only things to see and things to hear that we've never seen of and heard of before, but there are things to experience that we've never experienced before. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of guy that likes to experience things. I like to eat different food. Do you like to eat different food? I like to go to different countries. I like to eat different food because it's an experience. I like to jump out of airplanes. Why? Because it's an experience. I like to scuba dive. Why? It's an experience. I like to bungee jump. Why? Because it's an experience. That's all cool stuff. Experience. Now, there's some things I, I'd like to experience, but I'm getting too old. Hey, do you ever see them guys that fly in those flying suits? That's like my ultimate dream experience. How many have seen them? They get these suits, they got webbing in here, and they got webbing in between, and they jump off of cliffs, mountain cliffs, and they soar and they fly like birds. I mean, I have dreams of flying. That's like the ultimate experience. I think it takes too long to get to that point, so I don't know if I'll ever do it. But anyway, I digress. There are going to be experiences in heaven we've never experienced before. that are impossible to experience here. Physical mankind is hooked on experiences. And so physical, man has, uh, we've invented things like alcohol and drugs for experience. Amusements and entertainment and thrills and on and on we could go. We are experience oriented. Some of these experiences are acceptable before God, and some of our experiences are not. Mankind, as you know, has developed a myriad of sinful pleasures and continues to do so. Pleasures are considered sinful as defined by the Word of God, not man. And there are a lot of experiences and pleasures, we'll put quotes around that, pleasures to the flesh and to the old nature that are called wickedness in the Bible and sin in the Bible. And mankind makes excuses and concocts justifications and rationalizations for every vile and wicked pleasure that it has devised. 
They want, we know in our heart it's wrong, but they want to tell us why it's not. Yeah. We know it's not good for us, but they want to tell us why it is. But God is not mocked. Sinful pleasures come with a price. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The truth is, God is the one who created pleasure. True, righteous pleasure. Just look over his creation and enjoy the pleasure of sight. Listen with pleasure and hear the birds in the morning. <clears throat> Touch and experience with pleasure the softness of the fur of a rabbit. God created that. God created my sense of sight and my sense of hearing and my sense of touch and my sense of taste. He gave me the senses so that I could enjoy pleasures, didn't he? And he made all this stuff. He made that little rabbit and said, here, hey, you want to feel something? Feel this. And we reach out with the fingers that he's given us and the receptors that he has provided and we touch it. We go, ooh, that is so soft. And we like to rub it on our face because it feels even softer. God did that. God's not a, a, a cosmic killjoy. God's not some Scrooge in the sky that doesn't want us to have any pleasure. He said, I've created a whole world of pleasure for you. Take the pleasure of the sweet and the exhilaration of the sour. God created that. Listen to the beauty of music. God created that. Feel the emotion of love and the pleasure of joy. God created that. Is he, is he not awesome? He didn't have to create joy. Well, I guess he did because he is joy. But isn't it awesome that God would create that for us? And yet all of the pleasures of earth, there are pleasures that so far overshadow them that it's like the difference between night and day when we get to heaven. There is, in the presence of God, a fullness of joy unknown on planet Earth. A joy that is uncorrupted and unsullied by sin and the baneful things of planet Earth that's cursed. There are, in the presence of God, pleasures, the likes of which we have never known or experienced. And it says pleasures forevermore. That means they're never ending. The pleasures of this life are fleeting, are they not? And they are unsustainable. But the pleasures and glory are everlasting and unending. I mean, you can watch a sunset, but you can only watch it for so long. Amen? The pleasures of heaven are forevermore. Turn with me to Psalm 36, just a little bit from where you might be now. Psalm 36, I want you to look at verses 7 and 8. Psalm 36, verses 7 and 8, we're talking about the pleasures. God not only has the things for us to see and hear and taste, but he has the pleasures for us to enjoy. Psalm 36, verse 7 says this, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. God helps us understand, again, with human pictures, pleasures that come one after another like the constant flowing of a mighty river. Now, I, I've, I've lived near rivers all my life. I lived in, in Pittsburgh, and you got three rivers over there, uh, and, and they just keep going. They don't stop. How many of you ever been to Niagara Falls? That's a river. It never stops. Or did you ever get, like, amazed at how much water's going over there, and it never stops? That's what God says his pleasures are like. It's like, it's like Niagara River. It's like the Mississippi, the mighty Mississippi. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming, and you can't stop it, and it never stops. That's how the pleasures are in heaven. At God's right hand, pleasures forevermore just coming and coming. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to go. The believer will experience emotions and sensations beyond human imagination. 
We're going we're gonna to know love like we've never known love before. On a whole different level. We're going to have sensations in our being that we've never ever experienced before. That we can't even imagine. In heaven, life itself is a continual pleasure. Unmatched by anything experienced on earth or the combination of all earthly pleasures rolled into one. Now life here has pleasures. But life there is pleasure. <laughs> and so there will be things. And there will be pleasures. And my third point is the righteousness. Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. The things, the pleasures, and the righteousness. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 13. Peter writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, Nevertheless, we, that's born again people, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. This is something I'm looking forward to. No sin. No sin. Isaiah put it this way. In Isaiah 60 verse 21 he said this. Thy people also shall be all righteous. All of us shall be righteous and righteousness shall be all of us. We, in this earth we can do righteousness. In heaven we will be righteous. Never again to sin against God or others. Never again to lie or to cheat or to peek or to whisper. And we could go on and on, couldn't we? Never again to let God or anyone else down. Never again to disappoint. Never again to discourage. Never again to offend. Only righteousness. Only that which is right. In heaven exists only eternal righteousness. Listen, we're not, I want you to understand, we're not looking for anything like this old world and these old heavens. It says here a new heavens and a new earth. We're not looking for something restored or renewed. We're looking for something new. We're not going to have a glorified earth. It's not going to be like a made over wonderful planet earth. No, it's a new earth. This old one is gone. It's passed away. And remember, the former is not going to be brought to mind. So I, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't think it's even going to look like this old earth. It's not like he's going to clean up New York City. No, no. It says a new earth and new heavens. An earth and a heaven the likes of which we've never seen or imagined. And yes, God uses human words and concepts to help us understand, because if he used words and concepts that speak in terms which we could not understand, what would be the point? You know, if God said, instead of saying you're going to walk on streets of gold, if he said, you're going to... <laughs> yeah, great, right? Can't wait. But he says you're going to walk on streets of gold. Why? Because we know what that's like. We, we, we get it. See? See? We get it. Someone might say, might say, well, if the Bible says streets of gold, it's streets of gold. Yeah, but it ain't going to be a gold like you know. It's not going to be like your gold coin that you have hidden away in your box somewhere in your house. Matter of fact, he says the gold in heaven is transparent. It is so pure, you can see through it. I've never seen anything. I've never seen gold like that. It's not going to be like this gold, shiny. It's not, he's not going to shine up all our gold. No, it's going to be a gold that's transparent in its purity. How do you explain a brightness beyond the brightness of the sun? How do you, huh? And yet the Bible says in Revelation 21, 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is is the light thereof. I mean, I can't imagine that. Why? Because I'm a human being. 
But when we get to heaven, there's a glory beyond the glory of the sun that is Jesus. And I'm going to see it with my eyes and feel it with my being. In Revelation 22, verse 5, And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Wow. How do you explain a city, the description of which defies human imagination? In Hebrews 11.10, speaking of our forefathers, it says they were looking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The most beautiful city built by men is a broken down maggot infested slum compared to a city whose maker and builder is God. I've never seen such a city. I mean, I've been, I've been around the world, I've seen some beautiful cities. But they're all just a crumbled mess compared to the city that God's going to build. How do you explain a place where there's no sin? When sin has been so pervasive throughout mankind's existence. And yet Revelation 21, 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into the... Into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever maketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know what it's like to be in a place where there's no sin. Neither do you. How do you explain a place where there are no more tears and no more death to a world that's full of tears and death is common? And yet the Bible says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Those are former things. Those are things that are associated with this earth. When we get to heaven, there's no pain. There's no migraines in heaven. Amen. There's no lower back pain in heaven. Huh? There's no tears in heaven. We don't know what that's like. All of us have cried. Tears of sorrow. But in heaven there's no tears. And there's no death. We'll never be separated from anyone again. That's incredible. Amen. Glory to God that he has revealed these things to us in his word. And provided a way of escape from sin and death into eternal life and peace. Through his son the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 says how shall we escape? Escape what? This old earth. How should we escape? Escape what? The penalty of sin. How should we escape? Escape what? The flames of an eternal fire. How should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? For neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Oh, there are things. And there are pleasures. And there is righteousness, the likes of which we have never known, nor can we ever imagine, that await us who know Jesus Christ as Savior. Dear child of God, John wrote this about Jesus. And I believe it, we can say it with him this morning when he said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Glory to God. What awaits us beyond this place called earth. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You hear today and you're a Christian? This and more awaits you. Live in light of it and live worthy of it. You're here today, you're not saved, you're watching, you're listening. You can become a child of God. Only the children of God will experience these things. And you can become a child of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And as many as received him, the Lord Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why? 
because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. My dear friend, if you ever want to see anything that I talked about today, you must be born again. And if you've never been born again, you can be born again right where you sit. Because it's a transaction between you and God, your faith, and His grace. He will forgive your sins and save your soul and make you His own child and take you to this place that He's promised. If you will but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him as your Savior. He's not asking you to do anything, not asking you to promise anything. He's asking you to believe His promise of everlasting life through faith in Christ. You say, preacher, I, wanna, I want that. I want to be born again. I want to go to heaven. I want to be a child of God. I, I want forgiveness of sins. If that's what your desire is this morning and you would like to receive Christ right where you sit, in the privacy of your own heart and mind, I want you to look up at me right now. You're looking up and you're saying, Preacher, I heard what you said. I don't want to miss out. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to trust Christ right now, right where I'm sitting, because I want to go to heaven too. Anybody like that here? You're, you're trusting in church. You're trusting in baptism. You're trusting in confirmation. You're trusting in rituals. They'll all fail. Only Jesus can save. You say, I need him, and I want to trust him right now. Anybody like that? Just look up at me. And we can pray together. And you can trust Christ right where you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But Father, the Bible is very clear. It says light came into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. And I pray if there's anyone in this room, anyone watching or listening, that's still in the darkness because they've never come to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. They've never been born again. The Bible says God is light, and in Him is no darkness. Father, I pray that we're called children of light in the Bible. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone that needs Christ to be saved and born again and become a child of God, that, Lord, you'd move their heart to do so. And I pray you'd bless us as Christians that we might come and say, Lord, I want to live worthy of that which you have prepared for me. I believe it by faith. One day I'll see it and hear it and touch it and be there. Help us, Lord, to live with our eyes toward heaven, looking on the things that are not seen. And we'll give you the glory, honor, and praise as you bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 310. Stand with me, please. Turn your hymn books to 310. But listen, rather than standing and singing, maybe you'd like to bow your knee and pray. Maybe you'd like to come up and sit in this front row and just talk with the Lord and pray about something that he's talked to your heart about. Maybe you'd like to come and praise him and thank him and say, Lord, I just don't have enough words to express how thankful I am for what you have prepared for me. And I am so unworthy. And maybe you'd like to come and say, Lord, my life hasn't really been worthy of your name. There's changes need to be made. Make them today. Decisions, make them today as we sing on the first. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol Cast out every foe, now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow, now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. We're not looking for a new and improved. We're just looking for a new. It will be improved, but it won't be this one. It'll be a brand new. Just like our new life, it'll be brand new heaven and brand new earth. Are you looking forward to it? Yes. Are you living like you're looking forward to it? Maybe you'd like to come and spend a few moments with the Lord, whatever it's about. You feel free to do so as we sing on the third. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, that thy crucified feet 
Thy fate for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. On the last. Lord Jesus, thou seest I patiently wait. Come now and with me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never saidst no. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Mark, would you close us in prayer, please? Father, the things that we heard today. Lord, just bless our hearts as Bible-believing, born-again Christians, the things that are beyond our even understanding. You put them in terms for us to help us a little bit understand, Lord, but we won't really know until we get there, Father, in such great joy and love that puts in our hearts towards you, Lord, that you've prepared these things for us, Father God. And Lord, there's uh, those that might be here listening, watching, that have heard these things and wondered to themselves, these are wonderful things. I would like to partake of this, but they're not born again, Father God. Help them to trust under the shadow of thy wings. Put a desire in their heart to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to realize that there's a prerequisite for uh, being able to share these things with God for all eternity, and that is being born again through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, give them the courage and the wisdom to know to make that right decision, Father God. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's close with one verse of 418. 418. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. You are dismissed. See you tonight.